and we find um, the same thing and New London people are still shocked that there was slavery in the north um, and I think our conference that we had, Slave Dwelling Project, um, Joe McGill, who goes to all these sites throughout the country trying to gain recognition for enslaved people that lived here, really wanted some people from the north because a lot of the people that present at the conference are from the south. Um, and it's something we're all trying to gain more recognition to get people to realize that um, this history was not hidden at the time, it's just become hidden. And a lot of times, you know, people hear about the north and they believe that everybody was an abolitionist. Um, and when you see all this information, you realize how that is just so far from the truth. Um, so if you could do the next slide. This is the house that I represent. I'm with uh, Connecticut Landmarks. We have about 10 houses in Connecticut. This one is in New London, Connecticut. Um, it's the Joshua Hempstead House. And it's the oldest house left in New London. Um, so we get people that come, maybe for that reason, maybe because it's been restored. Um, but we're really trying to share these stories. You know, this was a house, um, the first Robert Hempstead comes in 1649. And even then, there's already been slavery when they get there because to really get to this part where they land and you know, John Winthrop Jr. and they're settling, um, you've already had the Pequot War, the 1636, 1637 time period, um, where you have the largest tribe in our region of New London really decimated by the British. Um, you find there have been disputes about trade, whether people were disputing with the Dutch or with them. And so um, in 1638, you find a, a ship, the Desire, that leaves from Salem, Massachusetts to the West Indies that has 17 Pequot men on board. Because basically, if you weren't murdered, um, you know, they burned the village, the Pequot village there. Um, they wanted all the men gone, and so they sent them overseas, and those people become the first um, native enslaved that leave this country and they go to the West Indies. So that's sort of before our Hemsteads even get there to show how ingrained this slavery was in the country. Um, so then Robert Hempstead lands in 1649, they settle this area, um, and you find there isn't much resistance to people taking this land because the strongest tribe has already been gone. You find the women and children of the Pequot tribe might be indentured um, in this part of the country. Um, and a lot of times that indenture never actually ended. So basically they too were enslaved. Um, and so we tell a story, you know, this house had 10 generations of Hempsteads in it. So it's never been um, outside the family and then it was donated to Connecticut Landmarks, Antiquarian Landmark Society, um, as it was known then, um, to be a museum. And we have two sides to it. The side with the diamond windows is the oldest, 1678, and then we have a 1728 side. And what you find in New London is that um, there was always um, slavery, much like Sylvester Manor. You know, this was a farm. It was only 14 acres, but a lot of times people in New London took farmland outside of the town as well. Um, but it was always provisioning. A lot of supplies, horses, um, food went to the West Indies, to the sugar plantations, because they didn't really want to grow anything but sugar. Um, so you find people in New London uh, from colonial times taking shares out on slave ships, and that was a way to make money. Um, and so we find in our house, we didn't have um, any enslaved people until we got to 1727. Um, but if you go to the next slide, another reason our house um, was probably preserved and people were interested in it was this diary. Joshua Hempstead um, is the third generation born of the Hempstead family. We believe he's born in 1678 when that house is first built. Um, and he keeps a diary from 1711 to 1758. Um, and these are just a few of the pages of the diary. It is very long. Um, you know, for him, it's really a work document. We always ask kids that come, oh, what do you think he wrote in his diary? And they're like, secrets. And, and they have all these ideas, his feelings. Um, it's really a work document. Every day starts with the weather um, and then what the work was. Um, but the diary is really helpful when studying slavery in New London, um, and that's not what it was used for. Originally, people used it just to learn about colonial times in New London. Um, he's kind of a rock star with the historic community because this was this really long document of this man giving a glimpse into colonial New London. Um, and people didn't really understand all the names listed in the diary. You know, it's a long project. The New London County Historical Society has actually transcribed it, now we a new edition. Um, and they hold the diary for us. We are not a climate-controlled site. 
Um, but the diary, then you find people started studying it. If you go to the next slide, this book came out just a few years ago for Adam's sake, A Family Saga in Colonial um, New England. And that's by Allegra de Bonaventura. And she started studying the diary um, to trace this Joshua Hempstead as a father in Colonial New England. He's really unusual. He has nine children. His wife dies after the birth of the last daughter. Um, all his oldest children are boys. So he has six boys and then these three girls. And when his wife dies, he doesn't know what to do because he doesn't have anyone to really take care of the children. So he actually sends um, three children over to Long Island, which is where his wife is from, um, to Southfold. Um, and studying the diary and learning about him as a father, she saw these names that kept appearing. And one name in particular that comes in 1727 is Adam Jackson. Um, and he is purchased as an enslaved person. Joshua Hempstead was a shipbuilder. That's originally how he was apprenticed. He is a farmer. He carves gravestones. He makes coffins, he keeps his diary, and then he becomes a probate court judge and justice of the peace. Um, so he's able to rise more than the Hempsteads would have been able to back in England. Um, but that means he doesn't have as much time for his farm work. After his wife dies, he does not bring um, any enslaved labor into the house at that time. He does hire out women from town. Um, but in 1727, he's doing a probate inventory for the Fox family. Um, and he stumbles across Adam Jackson, who he probably knew, who was an enslaved farmer. At that time, the man is 27 years old, and Joshua purchases him at that point. And he writes about it in his diary. You know, people always want to know, what did he say about that, you know, this big moment in his life? And basically, he wrote, um, today I purchased Adam Jackson for 85 pounds. He put down five pounds, and the rest he's buying on interest, because he's expensive. And at this point, you know, most of his sons have moved on. Um, the oldest one is the one that will get everything that he has, his land, his family. Um, so then we find that addition to the house comes in 1728 because it's releasing Joshua and his son Nathaniel from doing a lot of the farm work. Um, but what's interesting about this family is, um, you know, for Adam's sake, he's one of the best documented colonial enslaved men. But at the same time, what we have about him is what he did for work every single day. You know, is he sledding wood? He does a lot of work for neighbors, so Joshua also makes money from the labor that Adam does for others. We find other people that he's working with in New London. And a common refrain you hear up in the North is that slavery was better here. Um, people kept families together. And much like you showed your 1790 census, we show that at our house. That's the first census that's done. Um, obviously, Adam's way before that. But what you see is in New London homes, even middle class families, they usually have between one and three enslaved people in the house, and that's it. So the enslaved people are really scattered throughout the town. They're not kept together with their families. If you look at Adam Jackson, um, in 1727, he comes to this house, but before that, he's always been at the Fox family with his mother. Um, and his sister, but his mother gets to be a free woman. She's married to John Jackson, um, who is a free um, man who comes from the West Indies. His owner had released him. So Joan gets this chance to be sleep free, but she has to leave those two children behind in slavery. So Adam's about three and his sister Mary is a baby. And so she moves off site. We think she still sees them. They think sometimes she did nurse Miriam, but those children now don't have their mother with them. Their father is a free man. They live over with this Rogers family near the Mamacoke area, which is by the shore of New London. Um, so you find families were separated. It was really common. Um, and so when Adam comes to our house, we think that's the first time he's taken away from his sister, who eventually is sold herself to Norwich. And you find this family, which is what the book really covers, is that um, his mother becomes free, but there's a fight between two different white families about her. And, she gets put back into slavery. Because basically she's seen as property and they think the person that inherited her was the wrong person, so she should never have been freed. Um, so it's a really dramatic story. And like you're saying with the court documents, we have court documents that um, John Jackson signed because when they put her back into slavery, he and his former owner sail across Long Island Sound. She was brought to Long Island and then they take her and they hide her in Rhode Island. They do find her, but there is that court document and there's so many court papers about this case um, that that's how we have so much information. And so it is interesting, a lot of times if you do start looking, sometimes you can find amazing resources on the enslaved people. Um, and what we've tried to do at um, our site is really, this was kind of a story people heard at our site, and a lot of times they think, 
oh, Adam lived there with a family who's probably just like one of the family. Um, we really try and show that it is confusing to people who are taught sort of the plantation system of the South. Um, but these people were not treated like the family. You know, there had been a story that maybe um, because the children that are there, it's their grandfather that keeps the diary, their father dies, who adds on to the house, and so become wards of their grandfather. And basically, Adam Jackson's the one that teaches them farming. They're always in the field with him every single day with this enslaved man. So maybe he had um, a kinder version of slavery. But if you look, we'll go to the next slide. This is just the inside of our house, two people portraying Joshua, who's always writing, and then there's Adam. And then the next slide, we find that Joshua's um, grandson becomes the sheriff of New London. He's the one that's grown up with Adam Jackson. And we find this runaway ad for another woman that was enslaved by herself in this house in about 1800. Um, she's on the census of 1800. The next thing we find about her is 1803. This is a runaway ad that Joshua, the sheriff, puts out for her. Um, it's really strongly worded. Ran away from the subscriber on the night of the 27th April, a Negro woman named Dinah, about 40 years of age, who carried away with her several articles of clothing. Whoever will return said runaway shall be generously rewarded. All persons are forbid harboring or concealing her on penalty of the law, New London, um, May 2nd, 1803. We don't know what happened to Dinah. We still haven't found anything else. There are a lot of, that's a common name that was given. Um, so there's a book we have in New London Southeastern um, Roots, and it just lists all the um, African people that were there by first name or last name, and we can't find anything more about her. But we try and show that it really continued this legacy of slaveholding. Another of Joshua's grandsons um, is famous for the Revolutionary War in our area, Stephen Hempstead. He's known as Fighting Stephen. He's kind of everywhere you want to be in the Revolution. <laughs> He's the last one that sees Nathan Hale. He claims he sees George Washington read the Declaration of Independence in New York City. And then you don't really hear about him. He says his house was burned down to the burning of New London. And then in 1811, he goes off to St. Louis because one of his sons has been the deputy governor there. And then you see in his diaries that Missouri Historical holds this long legacy of slave owning with that family. Um, really bad conditions with large numbers of enslaved people. Um, women are always running away from this family. Um, so you just see this legacy continue. Venture Smith is a famous um, enslaved person of Connecticut. He was um, royalty, and he buys his freedom. He finds a way to buy his freedom um, from Connecticut. But one of the people that he, he dictates his life story, and he writes about one of these grandsons, Hempstead Minor, that promises him his freedom, but really is just buying him on credit to try and basically flip him like people do houses today to try and make money. And he writes about how horrible Hempstead Minor was to him. So we just find this long legacy. <coughs> and people used to ask at the Hempstead houses, weren't there more enslaved people? And they would say, oh no, we just know about Adam. And really it's important to share these stories. It's important for people to know um, the legacy of slavery that was so long. Our diarist is third generation New London, but so is Adam Jackson, that enslaved man that he brings to the house. His mother, um, was Joan Jackson, and her mother was the first to come to New London. Maria, she was um, a deaf enslaved woman. Um, and we believe one of her owners was the father of her daughter. So you just find all this legacy of slavery. And what we try and share is that, you know, in Connecticut, a lot of people are surprised slavery didn't officially end until 1848. And we do tell the story of abolitionists. When you get to the 1830s, some of our family members become abolitionists, but what you learn is that, um, Abolition still wasn't popular. Um, there's not one building that will allow them to meet in the town of New London to have an anti-slavery meeting. Um, and that's in 1838. So it just shows that really these legacies go on for so long. Um, and so we're just trying to educate people, much like you all, and we're trying to find connections so that people really do learn more about slavery in the North. Because it was a different system, but it wasn't a better system. And I think I got it.